Thank you. Cass. We had a great Sunday last week. It was just really good to celebrate as a church. I, I, I think we in the West, we struggle with grief and we struggle to grieve properly and we struggle to celebrate properly. There's a lot we can learn from people in other places around the world, I think, in these two areas. But last week was a week of celebration. I love having a Sunday morning when I come to church on Sunday night and I just tell people that weren't there, I say, you missed out. I hope you feel bad. Because isn't that, isn't that good? Like, because you want people to think there's something special and unique that happens when we meet together that you can't just get in an email or on a video feed. Do you know what I mean? There's something that happens in family life when we actually sit around the table together. I need you to interact with me for a moment. I need you to put your hand up because I'm going to ask you some questions that you might have heard said, some statements that you might have heard said around this church, or you may have felt it yourself. You may have said it yourself, or you may have felt this yourself, okay? So is this a statement that resonates with you? Is this a statement that you've heard or that you've said yourself? All right, can everyone just practice putting their hand up? Good, I'm going to do it as well. All right, there we go. Yeah, very good. There's nothing much happening in my spiritual life lately. I'm pretty flat. Okay. It's been a while since I've had a really good spiritual conversation or a deep talk with someone in the church. It's been a while since I've had a good spiritual conversation or talk with someone outside the church. I can't remember the last time someone asked me how I'm really going. I remember, thanks, Kathy. Homemade lasagna today for lunch, everyone. Um, just thought I'll, if I didn't read it out then, I might have forgotten. So thanks, Kath. Appreciate that. Just, am I preaching that bad? I think Mike has been confronted by my probing questions. How are you really going, Mike? Um, I bet most of our church doesn't even know what I'm going through. Come on, you lot. I don't really feel like I'm using my gifts and talents in the way that I can in the local church. Okay, so they're more personalized. What about these ones more directed about church in, our church in general? I haven't seen many people come to faith lately in the church. I feel like the faith and excitement levels at church used to be higher. I want to see more evangelism, signs and wonders take place in our church. All right. Well, my message this morning is going to solve all of those unresolved questions. And um, you'll have no more. It'll just be like, wow, every question has been satisfied by this amazingly profound, deep message. I want to say this morning, following up from last week, last week was about acknowledging our Jerusalem, where God has planted us as a church. God has planted us in the city of Adelaide to make a difference to this city, not just to the western suburbs, but to the whole city. But this morning, I believe that God wants to speak to us corporately and individually about how we can renew our spiritual dynamism in our personal life, but also our corporate faith and excitement and the, the supernatural dimension of our church life and evangelistic power and growth. And I believe that these areas corporately and individually will only be met if we find our Samaria. Last week we spoke about Jerusalem. We find our Samaria and we go to it. You see, Samaria in the Bible days was a place where, particularly since the split of the two kingdoms. So Israel was 12 tribes. The 10 northern tribes, sorry, the 10 northern tribes separated 
from the other two southern tribes. So Judah was in the south and Israel was in the north. This guy, Rehoboam, who was Solomon's son, he kind of had a disagreement with a whole pile of tribes over taxes because people are basically the same in every generation. They whinge about taxes and money and their own personal issues and that's what we're going to be doing at the election. People generally vote on what's best for their bottom line and their bottom dollar. And so the, the top uh, tribes separated to form the nation, the kingdom of Israel under Jeroboam, and the southern kingdom was Rehoboam. And so there was this separation, and then eventually after a couple hundred years, the northern kingdom was taken over by the Assyrian Empire, and so the, the kind of the pure worship of the God of Israel was further eroded, and it was kind of like so corrupted that Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom, became a symbol of corrupted broken worship. It was a symbol of otherness. Samaria was less than and other than, and I don't think the average person in the South hated Samaria, but they just didn't really want anything to do with Samaria. So Samaria is a symbol of the other. And Jesus in John chapter 4, it says that they had to go through Samaria. You see, they were in the south, in Judah, and they had to go up north to Galilee, where Jesus spent a lot of time. And the fastest way was through Judah, was through Samaria. But most people in that day would actually bypass Samaria. They did not want to interact with Samaritans. And so Jesus went through Samaria. He interacted with a woman at a well, He changed her life, and as a result, she went back to her town. She told everyone, and many, many people in that town, their lives were changed forever. Samaria is a symbol of otherness coming to Jesus, the other coming to Jesus. It's a place, Samaria is a place where bigotry, suspicion, brokenness are confronted with the transformative, embracing love and power of Jesus. What is Samaria to us? Samaria for us, for you and for I, are the places in our life, the places geographically, the places socially, the places just around our community and beyond where we would try best to avoid. Are there people that you try to avoid? Are there situations that you try to avoid? You know what I think a lot of people in our society try to avoid? Awkwardness. Like, I know people that will just... I've had conversations with people. They're like, nah, I'm not going to do that because it just might be a bit awkward or uncomfortable. Well, pretty much anything of worth that I've ever done has involved awkwardness or uncomfortableness in the early stages. Meeting someone for the first time is awkward and uncomfortable until that person, the first time I met my wife was awkward and uncomfortable for me because I was nervous. But I quickly got over that. I mean, anything, and, and so we... Run away from anything that is other, awkward or uncomfortable. And so Samaria are the places that we would like to avoid. Are there places in this city that you don't want to go to? I remember when I was a teenager and I made this comment, I just watched a documentary on the slums in India. And I said this comment, I said, God, I'll go anywhere, but I don't want to be a missionary to the slums of India. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Just send someone else, not me. And that night, I had a dream that I was preaching in the slums of India. And I've never, ever said that to God ever again. And just for the record, God, I'm still open, but I'd prefer not to. Okay. What are the places that you'd try to avoid? It's not that we hate Samaritans. It's just that it's not on our radar. Because we're focused on our backyard. We're focused on our church and our life, our comfort, our ministry. And our focus on self, corporately, focus on our own local patch here as a church, but also our, our own spiritual life, takes our eyes off what the Spirit might want to do in and through us. Because you see, the Holy Spirit of God breaks down walls and is a missionary spirit. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says this, Jesus, as he's about to ascend and be at the right hand of the Father, he's about to physically leave his disciples. And he says, you will receive power. Everyone say, will. How powerful do you feel? I, I want you to know the normal Christian life is a life of walking in the power of the Spirit. It's not, 
It's, it's not power to confront or power to dominate. It's power to serve and to love. Do you feel powerful? Do you feel like you have power to serve and to love and to speak and to embrace and to move into uncharted territory? Because God says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and where? Samaria. The place where Jesus actually, when he originally sent out the disciples, he said, I want you to focus on our own family, the Jews. I don't want you to go to Samaria and I don't want you to go to the Gentiles. Jesus' primary ministry was actually to Jews. But now when the Spirit comes, this prophesied Holy Spirit that we read about in Acts chapter 2, where the Spirit will be poured out upon all flesh, men, women, young, old, Jews, Gentiles, that there was this outpouring of the Holy Spirit where all of those barriers that used to separate people would come tumbling down by the Spirit of reconciliation. And you see, so God, Jesus is saying there is a changing of the guard going to take place and areas that used to be no-go zones are going to be go zones. Okay, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses in Samaria and the ends of the earth. But you see, the early church, I think we often like to think about the early church as being perfect. It's like the utopia because it's like, what did they do? Every night they were kind of meeting in home, singing Kumbaya. They were sharing their meals. They were like the ideal communist state, but they weren't communist because the government took away their money. They were communist because they gave away their money to each other. And so the rich gave to the poor and no one was in need. Isn't that amazing? No one was in need. There was like worship parties. They were witnessing. It was kind of like when you read about that early church, you think, oh God, if only it was like that now. But you see, often when I hear stories about the founding of this church, a group of young adults and and, um, teenagers that were just in love with each other and in love with God and they had intimacy and fellowship and power and worship and evangelism. And I think, oh wow, that sounds like the good old days. But the good old days aren't always so good. You see, that early church, as we read through the New Testament, developed into being a church with lots of corruption, lots of prejudice, lots of racism, um, preconceived notions of who's in and who's out. Um, There was lots of divisions. There was lots of immorality in the early church. The early church was broken just like us because it was full of human beings, okay? Okay. And that early church, they were given the commission to be the witnesses of Jesus in Jerusalem, Samaria, the ends of the earth. But do you know what part of that mission that they didn't do? They didn't do the Samaria and the ends of the earth thing. They stayed put in Jerusalem. Pretty much all of the founding leaders in the church, they stayed put in Jerusalem. And so Jesus, by his missionary spirit, was sending the church out to see God's kingdom of life and love take over the world, not by force, but by example and by witness and by demonstration of the Spirit's power. But no one went to Samaria. No one went to the ends of the earth. So what happened? Well, the devil made a big mistake in that he tried to wipe out the church. You see, the devil is always trying to kill the church, but he always fails. Wherever the devil tries to kill the church, it's always a sign that he's about to get his butt handed to him. Because he cannot kill the church. The church of Jesus Christ has been promised and secured by the Lord Jesus. The gates of hell will not prevail over the church. And so there's this great persecution that comes on the church. And what the devil meant for evil in killing Stephen, the first Christian martyr, it actually led to the church spreading throughout the world. So... It says in Acts chapter 8, on that day a great persecution after Stephen was stoned to death. What a hero he was. A great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So the people that weren't the core leaders of the church, they were sent out as witnesses. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. That sounds like Nazi secret police, doesn't it? Going from house to house and throwing people in prison. That's what sent out the church to Samaria and the ends of the earth. And you see, wherever, and God's heart is by whatever means, political or social, his heart is for the gospel to go to the ends of the earth and to leave our Jerusalem. 
to, stay, to start with Jerusalem, but then go out. See, the communists in China in 1949 tried to wipe out the church. They made Christianity and, and Christians meeting together basically illegal. In 1949, at the time of the communist revolution, um, there was hundreds of Christian missionaries in China, and they were all expelled. And there was around 4 million Christians in China in 1949. And most experts in the West thought that that was the end of the church in China. But what the devil meant for harm, God used for good. And that was the start of the single greatest revival, organic grassroots apostolic revival in human history since the early days of the church to, to, to the point where today the church in China is the fastest growing in the world and with, will potentially within my lifetime be larger than the church in the United States of America, being hundreds of millions of people. It's really hard to get accurate figures about how big the church in China is. And as the balance of power internationally shifts from the United States to China being a world superpower, isn't that amazing? What is going to take over the, the ideological authority of the Communist Party in China? What's going to replace that? Christianity is best placed to replace communism as the founding ideolo ideology of the people of China. So it's amazing. What is God doing in the world? I'm not a prophet. I'm just saying, what is God doing in the world? And so um, one scholar said this, that the wind increases the flame. The devil tried to blow out the flame of the Holy Spirit. <sighs> but where he blew, the flame just arose. And that's in Acts chapter 8. That's what happened. And it goes on to say in Acts chapter 8 verse 4, those who've been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to the city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he had to say. Don't you love the fact that this preacher, Philip, had very little experience, just like Stephen who died before him, a man with little experience, a man that was dedicated to service. He was given an opportunity and all of a sudden, signs started following the preaching of the gospel. And people started listening. Verse 7, For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was great joy in the city. Do you believe that God wants there to be great joy in our city? Do you believe that God wants there to be great joy to the Samaritans, those outside our western suburbs? Do you believe that God wants this to be a city of churches? Because you know what? This is not a city of churches. This is a city of cathedrals and chapels. This is a city of dead churches. And I'm not speaking about human beings. I'm speaking about dead buildings. The first time I came to Adelaide, I was struck. It was like Paul in Athens. I was struck by how religious they were. You know, I was struck by how many church buildings there were. But in every census for the last couple of generations, Adelaide has been the most secular city in the country it has by far the most number of people that tick no religion and the number is growing and growing and growing there are very very few churches built upon the new testament pattern that are growing that are reaching the lost that are planting churches that are sending out missionaries in this city and so do you believe that god wants this to be a city of churches once again and because whenever there is a movement that stops Reaching out to Samaria, the other, planting new churches, sending out missionaries, preaching the gospel with signs following. That is a sign of a church and a movement that is on the decline. We see it in the history of the church in South Australia. Churches that were once hotbeds of revival and now full of still wonderful godly people. But as movements, they are in decline. It says in verse 8, there was great joy in the city. I believe God wants to bring joy into this city. I believe God wants to bring joy into your life. One of the most inconvenient questions that someone asked me, Pastor Norm Reed, he goes, hey, Timmy, because he calls me Timmy. If you call me Timmy, it will annoy me, but when Norm says it, he can get away with it because this is how he talks. Um, he, Timmy, how's your joy life going? I was like, Norm, don't ask me that. I've been up since the crack of dawn with the kids and I'm tired and I'm grumpy. Just ask me about sport or weather or something like that. 
give me something to complain about. I mean, how probing is that? Hey, Rochelle, how's your, how's your joy life going? What do you say? Matt, how's your joy life going? Like, it's very confronting. But do you know what? I think God wants... You and your personal life, you and your ministry life, you, in spite of circumstances, that the joy of the gospel, the adventure of the Holy Spirit, that wherever I go, I'm walking in the Spirit and I'm alive to Jesus and He wants to operate through me. There's joy in that. We become fully human. We become in touch with the leading of God and we become in touch with His mission for the world. There was great joy in that city. Verse 14, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Isn't that interesting? They'd been baptized in water, but they had not received this, uh, the the Holy Spirit coming upon them. When When Peter and John placed their hands on them, they received Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying of hands of the apostles, he offered them money. That's how you know it's good. Because the, the, the sorcerer in town, the charlatan, he's just like, can I just give you guys money because I want this. Now, how did he see the Spirit come upon them? I think the, the pattern in the book of Acts is that wherever the Spirit of God came in this Pentecostal fashion, there was... Speaking in tongues, there was prophecy, there was joy. There was an outpouring that was not just an internalized outpouring. There was something that happened that people could see that there was a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. So so it's in one sense, it's dangerous to put God in a box. But in another sense, it's to say, I expect that when God comes, I will receive power. I will receive power and something will happen. And the interesting thing about tongues, prophecy, and even joy and tears and all these sorts of things is it brings people together. You see, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, whether it be Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, whether it be the, that kind of Samaritan outpouring in Acts chapter 8, whether it be the Gentile uh, outpouring in Acts chapter 10, you have Jews Samaritans, Gentiles being brought together under the one Holy Spirit, all sharing the same experience. And you see, Peter in Acts chapter 10 sees the Gentiles being filled with the Spirit and receiving the same experience as the Jews. And he says, well, I cannot find any reason not to baptize these people because the Spirit's come upon them the same as He came upon us. And so what happens is you have throughout the story of the early church, you have God in His sovereignty through the Holy Spirit bringing down the walls of division that have for centuries been built up. You see, we have a sickness in our society and it's been there since the Tower of Babel. Well, you have this story of the people's languages being confused. There's confusion, there's suspicion. There's people speaking past each other and not understanding. But here you have the Spirit of God uniting people, being able to speak in other languages, being able to speak prophetically the Word of God and to be able to come together despite the divides of culture and society. That is God's call for our church. And as soon as this church stops focusing on Samaria, the places we might like to avoid or the things that might like to be convenient, we will lose our mission and our focus. I believe two things God wants to do to turn around the spiritual flatness some of us experience, but also to energize faith and vision in us corporately. Let me speak about you personally, first of all. In any organization, in any church of a large size like this, we tend to congregate with people that are safe, that are comfortable, that are just like us. God has called us to be a church for all people. We are a church of around 850 people. And according to my very unscientific figures, I believe in a short period of time, we need to double and even triple the number of connect groups we have in this church. What does that mean? It means that there are people in this church And I'm not going to look at anyone in particular, but I could start naming names. You need to be leading a connect group. Because that's your Samaria. Because at the moment, you come to church on a Sunday, and you can talk to family or friends, and that's fine. But there's other people in the church that are not connected to anyone, and they need to connect to you. They need to be able to 
And, and, and you know what? If you're here and you need to be leading a connect group, I was talking to someone recently that full of gifts and full of love and full of wisdom, biblical wisdom, they said, I have not prayed for someone for years. And I thought, how sad. If they were in a connect group, they would be able to pray for someone every week or every fortnight when it met, whether it was weekly or fortnightly. That they would be able to communicate how they're really going and actually find out how other people are really going. It's very easy to hide in a church of this size. And I believe that the vision for our church as we grow more and more is we become smaller and smaller with more and more connect groups. And, it, and so even out of today, it's not beyond God that we could have a dozen people write on connect cards that they want to start connect groups. Now, I'll just throw it out there. Just because you volunteer to lead a connect group doesn't mean we'll have you leading a connect group. But I'll tell you, I'd prefer that people volunteer they're not. And, and there are people here, you need to be leading a connect group because there are people in your life that might not come to church, but they might come to your home. We need to live out. What I said, there's nothing much happening in my spiritual life lately. It's been a while since I've had a good conversation. It's been a while since I've talked to someone outside the church about deep spiritual things. Can't remember the last time someone asked me how I'm really going. I bet most of the church doesn't know how I'm really going. I don't really get to use my practical and spiritual gifts in church. You need to join a connect group or you need to lead a connect group. Like without, and and if you don't, you will will be unsatisfied in this church. And for some of you, you're really comfortable. This is your Samaria. You actually have to step out and your friendship circle might change. I remember going to a church for 18 months and struggling. Um, I, I didn't really have any friends and it wasn't until I branched out and started a connect group with people younger than me. And over a period of years, those people became my closest friends and we did life together. What about us as a church, corporately? I believe God's, the vision God gave us years ago is still there, that we are called to saturate geographically the city of Adelaide with families and the churches. Because this city needs to be a city of churches. And I don't want them to be weird, wacko, Pentecostal, or angry, grumpy, fundamentalist, or loose, liberal, believe anything, you may as well be a political party, churches. Like, I want gospel-centered, Holy Spirit-filled, according to the New Testament pattern, with solid governance and accountability. I want family-centered churches to be right across the city because I just see the need. And this is not my vision. This is a vision from years ago. This church, before any other, hardly any other churches in this city were planting churches, we were planting churches in the 80s and 90s. At the moment, we have seven churches. Seton, Murray Bridge, Blackwood, Lafever, Barossa, Alice Springs, Hobart. We have five outreaches from Kangaroo Island right up to our, some of our remote indigenous communities. And I'm so glad that this church has always had a vision for Samaria for the other, because this church that started with a group of young adults and teenagers is now a family of churches of around two and a half thousand people in three states. To God be the glory, and what does he have ahead? But God forbid that we ever start focusing only on Jerusalem and not Samaria. What might be ahead? I know this church sent out 70 people to plant the Blackwood Hills Christian Family Centre. And there was a massive gap in the church when those people left. But within months, they were all replaced by new people that had joined the church. That is the New Testament pattern. We have a micro vision to double the number of small groups, the number of people in small groups, that we are more connected as a community. We're becoming more vulnerable and connected as a community, eating together, reading the Bible together, praying together. But we have a macro vision to surround the city of attitude of Adelaide, city of attitude, city of Adelaide with vibrant, life-giving CFC churches. On our birthday, some of our lead pastors from our family centered churches sent through some 40th birthday congratulations and just shared a little bit about what God's doing in their churches. Let's have a look at the screen as we check out, hear from our lead pastors of some of our other locations around the city and beyond. Thanks. Greetings to everyone at uh, Seton. Uh, congratulations on a big four zero. That's an incredible milestone. And uh, everyone at Lefebvre wishes you all the best. When we grow up to be 40 years old, I hope we'll be ascending church, a generous church and a sacrificial church, just like you're modelling. Well done to everyone. Congratulations and uh, God bless you all. 
Hi Church, it's Pastor David Bland here from the Hills Christian Family Centre. I'm standing outside our office here in Bel Air and we are wishing you a very happy 40th birthday. We're giving thanks and celebrating with you for all the great things that have happened in the life of the church at Seton, including the birth of this church here and we're just rejoicing with the fact that you've reached this milestone. We're giving thanks for lots of great things happening here at the Hills. We're celebrating our Alpha Course Holy Spirit Retreat this weekend. We celebrated Mother's Day a couple of weeks uh, ago as well, which was a fantastic day. And giving thanks for the fact that on an average Sunday at the Hills, a third of our congregation are kids under the age of 12. So we trust that you have a fantastic time in May as you celebrate this milestone and we wish you guys all the best. God bless, the best is yet to come. Well, hi Christian Family Centre in Seaton. This is um, Norm all the way from Hobart. I may look a bit windswept, but it gets pretty windy down here sometimes. Hey, who could have imagined 40 years ago when the Christian Family Centre started that we'd have somebody here in Hobart with a Christian Family Centre church? And, you know, it's just amazing to, to look at what God's done through the um, Christian Family Centre. It's been great for me personally to be involved with the, um, the CFC for now 25 odd years, having been uh, active there at Seaton, but now here caring for the church in, um, in Hobart. Um, look, congratulations on your 40th birthday, and it's just such a privilege to be part of what God's doing through the Christian Family Centre Churches. God bless you all. Have a fantastic day. Hello from Alice Springs Christian Family Centre. We are so glad we're family. Happy birthday to you, and we look forward to doing the next 40 years together. Happy, Happy birthday, Seaton!